Before we really get going with the discussion here, so there's some famous words I want you guys to remember as we start talking about the USS Hoga. These words are spoken by the, the former mayor, Patrick Hayes, when he said, it is easier to get a submarine from Turkey than a tugboat from California. <laughs> so just remember those words as we sort of, we sort of discuss how the, uh, the Hoga's transportation from California to here uh, started to go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Travis Rotterman. I am the survey historian for the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. Uh, thank you for coming to the sandwiching and history tour of the USS Hoga. Uh, I'd like to thank the staff of the Inland Maritime Museum, especially Executive Director Greg Zahner, uh, Operations Director uh, Ryan Ed Miller, and Maintenance Chief Jim Gates uh, for allowing us to tour the facility today. Uh, this tour is worth one hour of AIA continuing education. Uh, please see uh, me after the tour uh, to sign up for those that you are interested in that. You are standing in front of uh, the only place in the world that you can go aboard vessels from the beginning and the end of World War II. Now we say that because you can actually see the beginning and the end in Pearl Harbor with the USS Missouri and the USS Arizona, but you cannot board the Arizona, so just get that there. Uh, today our tour will allow us to board the USS Hoga for free. Normally that's not the case. Uh, the museum has allowed us to do that. Uh, we are very gracious. Uh, you are able to do an entrance fee to go aboard the USS Razorback for a guided tour after this tour. Uh, speaking of the Razorback, which we have right here, how many people believe that the tour was named after a feral pig? <laughs> a wild boar, or the University of Arkansas? Anybody? Well, sorry. <laughs> you would be incorrect. The USS Razorback is actually named after a fin whale. Uh, all the battle class submarines of the uh, Sandlands Bear of Riot uh, variant were built as, in Portsmouth Naval uh, Shipyard in Kittery, Maine. All of the battle class subs are named or names are derived from fish or other marine creatures. Uh, I think it was Greg had a, a tour group that said that all of them were, were fish, and uh, one of the little girl in the tour corrected him and said a couple of them are named for sea creatures and that they are not fish. <laughs> but even even the best of us run into that every once in a while. The USS Razorback is here, also representing the end of World War II, as she entered Tokyo Bay on August 31st to participate in the formal surrender uh, ceremonies on September 2nd, 1945. The US Razorback is listed to the National Register of Historic Places September 1st, 2005, once she made it over here. The USS Hoga, standing behind you, which is YT-146, uh, represents the beginning of the United States' active involvement in World War II. She is named after the Sioux word for fish. The USS Hoga is best known for her actions during Pearl Harbor uh, attack on December 7th, 1941. Getting underway within 10 minutes of the first Japanese uh, bombs that fell, she went to work resulting uh, in rescuing sailors in the water, fighting fires, pulling ships uh, out of harm's way. For her actions on December 7th, 1941, the Department of the Interior listed the USS Hoga as a National Historic Landmark in 1989. She was named, at that point in time, she was named the City of Oakland. The USS Hoga was commissioned May 22nd, 1941, as a woven class district harbor tug. The Consolidated Shipbuilding Co Corporation of Morris Heights, New York, laid the USS Hoga's keel July 25th, 1940, this 100-foot-long uh, vessel is capable of 12 knots uh, through the use of two Macintosh and Seymour diesel engines, aka they are also known as the American Locomotive Diesel Engine uh, Company, and one auxiliary diesel engine. These two engines are connected to the motor room by two uh, Westinghouse electric motors, uh, which then go through a reduction gear into a single drive shaft uh, to the screw on the back of the boat. Uh, the Hoga is also outfitted with twin 250 horsepower electric uh, pump motors, which provided 2,000 gallons of water per minute. The main feature uh, seen on the main deck is also known as the deck house. Uh, the deck house, upon entering uh, in from the aft, holds the mess in the galley, uh, where officers and crewmen would be able to have, uh, cook, uh, eat, and commiserate, more or less playing cards, among other things. 
<laughs> Upon leaving the gallery in the mess area, you enter into a designated uh, as the washroom, along with the officer's quarters, also known as the officer's stateroom. There were normally two officers aboard, uh, stationed on the Hogan, and um, that's why you will see bunks within there. Uh, the bunks were essentially located, or centrally located in the cabin to allow for workspace for each of the officers. Below the main deck is the hold, our crew uh, berthing area. The hold contains the engines and motors and provide propulsion for the single, crew, single screw or propeller. Forward of the engine and motor room, the crew is in the berthing area and storage area. When the hogo was decommissioned and eventually transferred to Oakland, California, nothing was touched in the crew berthing area. As staff here at the Arkansas Inland Maritime Museum found out, there were still World War II era crates within the spare areas within the berthing area. At the time, they were unable to tour the. At, at this time, we were unable to to tour the hold in the crew berthing area. Uh, at this time, above the main deck in the boathouse is what is known as the pilot house, which contains the helm used to steer the vessel, along with the communication systems for the USS Hoga. As you will notice, that above the pilot house is one of the main water cannons and or monitors, as they call them. It is a place here to provide the best field of view uh, for crew members as well as the best range for the water cannon. Once it was commenced, uh, once we commenced touring after it, we're done with the presentation, uh, volunteer staff members of the Arkansas Inland Maritime Museum uh, will be stationed one in the galley and one in the pilot house to answer any of your guys' questions that you may have as you uh, tour through. <clears throat> with her layout complete, the USS Hoga was finally launched New Year's Eve 1940. It is probable that she went to sea trials between December 31st and May 22nd, 1941, as she was commissioned and put into service in the Brooklyn Naval Yard. Following the commissioning, the Hoga set sail for Pearl Harbor via the Panama Canal. Now, remember that she only went 12 knots. <laughs> she would travel through the canal up to San Diego, California, then on to San Pedro, California, and departing for Pearl Harbor. The journey was finally complete upon reaching Hawaii in August of 1941. Let us just put this into perspective. This vessel, to put it, okay, a submarine can go about 20 knots, and it'll take you five, roughly five and a half, six days in a nuclear sub going from San Diego to, to Hawaii. You're doing this at 12 knots. You're looking at roughly nine days on a 100 foot long ship <laughs> in, in various conditions. <laughs> Let's just sort of put that into perspective. Uh, Roughly nine days. Now you think the, the traveling from Brooklyn, New York, via the Panama Canal, and no more than 12 knots as well. It's a long journey in tight quarters. Upon arrival at Pearl Harbor, the yard tug, which is why it's designated YT-146, she would be immediately put into service, helping maneuver various naval ships into dry docks and berth bays found on Ford Island and the rest of the harbor. She would also provide waterfront fire protection in the Inner Harbor area, along, as well as security and other firefighting services. Her waterfront fire protection and fire services would make the USS Hoga a, a National Historic Landmark, roughly five months after arriving in Pearl. Many would say that the USS Hoga is one of the unsung heroes of the attack of Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. The exact time of the first wave is still, being, is, is still an issue in, for most historians. Uh, as the bombers and torpedo planes attack between 7.53 and 7.55. Or, you know, so a two minute difference for us is a big thing. It is known that the first wave went, was a very lax at Pearl Harbor in, uh, in the early Sunday morning watch. In the case of the men aboard the 94 ships within Pearl Harbor, uh, breakfast was being done for those that were aboard and those that were entering duty. The first wave of bombers and planes managed to create a, a lot of damage on battleship row. Uh, at that time. It is noted that only 30 minutes after the initial attack, the Arizona was burning was a burning wreck, the Oklahoma had capsized, the West Virginia had sunk, the California was going down, and every other battleship except for the Pennsylvania, was in, which was in dry dock, had been badly damaged, including the USS Nevada, which we're going to talk about. The Nevada is key to this story of the USS Hoda and her National Historic Landmark status through not only is the reason it garnered the high honor. Only 10 minutes after the initial bombing run of the Japanese planes, the USS Hoga, which was moored in the yard craft uh, dock, roughly, had received verbal orders from her dock officer to man stations and help in any way possible. After firing up her diesel engines, the USS Hoga was underway to assi assist ships pick up survivors by 820. 
Already by 8.30, the USS Vestal, a repair ship moored alongside the USS Arizona, was frantically trying to cut mooring lines and get away from the Arizona. And we have a diagram, because a lot of this is going to be discussing of where she moved people to. So without that, you know, you guys would be lost. So you gotta figure the Vestal, that's the Nevada, the Vestal's here and the Arizona's there. So the Vestal was trying to cut her mooring lines and get away from the Arizona, which was already on fire. With that, after beaching the Vestal, because she was able to back up, the Vestal was slightly damaged at this point, was, was starting to go down. The Hoga would, would beach the Vestal over on uh, Iaea uh, Point, which is up over here. Uh, pushed her up there and, and grounded her. <laughs> after beaching the Vestal in Iaea, the Hoga rushed to burst one, two, and three, where the tor torpedo traveled under the Ogallala, and, uh, which was tied up next to the light cruiser of the USS Helena. Now to put that in there, so she went from Iaea Point in very little time, went all the way down to burst one, two, and three. And here's the Ogallala and the Helena. So the torpedo went under the Ogallala, hit the Helena, exploded, hit the Ogallala, uh, causing some damage to her. She started to go. The Ogallala then gets pushed into the right behind uh, the Helena. Um, after the explosion, the, the, the explosion pierced a hole in the Ogallala, causing her to take on water. At 8.50 local time, the USS Hoga pushed the USS Ogallala to Helena's aft into berth three, where the Hoga held her in place while important paper and equipment were offloaded. It is in this location that the Ogallala eventually capsized. And there's some good pictures of, of that. Yet the action of the Hoga were conducted in order to possibly free up the USS Helena or at least did not have the hell of them pinned up against the dock, uh, dock 1, uh, 1010. Following the sinking of the Ogallala, the, Ho the Hoga picked up two survivors and returned to berth three. While the U.S. Hoga was helping push the Ogallala into berth three, the U.S. Nevada was moving south through the, south, through the southern channel. At 900, the Nevada was hit by five more bombs within earshot of the USS Hoga while she was helping the Ogallala. After taking repeated hits by the Japanese bomber, the crew of the Nevada decided to beach the vessel at Hospital Point uh, and keep, to try to keep her out of the channel. Now, to put that into perspective, Earth 3 is up here, so she got bombed roughly right there. The Nevada got bombed after backing up around the Nevada and the vessel, coming back south down the channel, got roughly about here before five more uh, bombs took her. So Hospital Point is down here. She was able to make her way down here before she knew she was going to sink. She hit with so much force into hospital point that her aft section actually started to swing along with the current, uh, which would have caused her to sort of sink in the channel itself, which is when the Hoga pushes her across the channel and ducks her over in this neck of the woods. Or that neck of the water, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the fires raged on the Nevada and the U.S. Hoga came to assist in extinguishing the fires. However, the Nevada ran aground with enough force that the stern to ship and swing her around to the bow of the ship was faced backwards into the harbor. Now the USS Hoga pushed the Nevada across the channel while still fighting the fires on her. While the Nevada was back to ground at 10.30, the USS Hoga would remain with the Nevada until roughly 1300 when she shifted her attention to the West Virginia. The West Virginia by this point was ablaze after being hit with nine torpedoes or bombs from the Japanese aircraft. Many of the crew members from the West Virginia eventually climbed aboard the USS Tennessee where they bravely fought fires raging on their ship. By 1300, the crew of the Hoga had arrived on the scene to help control the files, fires on the vessel uh, with their fire cannons. The Hoga was called off fighting fires on the West Virginia in order to aid in fire suppression on the Arizona. And the fires in the West Virginia raged for a total of 30 hours after she ceased operations and before she eventually sunk. Though the West Virginia was continuously ablaze for those 30 hours, the USS Hoga helped fight fires aboard the Arizona for nearly two days. The Hoga arrived in the Arizona, located at, um, at location F7, which we sort of talked about right here. They fought fires from 1600 on December 7th through 1300 on December 9th, 1941. So you figure two straight days of uh, fighting those fires. For the next three days, the, Ho the USS Hoka ran supplies, fought fires, secured barges, and patrolled Pearl Harbor for enemy subs. Once things settled down around Pearl, the chief boat's mate was given a citation by Admiral C.W. Admiral C. Nimitz for, quote, distinguished service in the line of profession of commanding officer of the Naval Yard Tug Hoga. 
an efficient action and disregard for his own personal safety when another ship was disabled and appeared to be out of control. Serious fires in the fore part of the ship. You moored your tug to, the, to, her, to her boat, assisted materially in extinguishing her fires. When it was determined that the damaged ship would be breached, as there was serious damage of her sinking in the channel. You assisted in beaching operations in an outstanding manner. Therefore, each member of the crew of the USS Hogan functioned in the most efficient manner and exhibited commendable disregard for personal danger throughout the operation. However, life inside Pearl Harbor would never be the same. Over the next couple of years, salvage operations and normal day activities took place. The Hogan would eventually return to yard craft duty, maneuvering vessels and barges in and out of dry dock and burst so that they could undergo repairs. She was reclassified in May of 1944 as YTB-146, which stands for uh, Yard Tug Big. They're not too, you know, big on their acronyms here. <laughs> it is also at this time that three more fire cannons were added to the Hoga, increasing her total number to four. By 1948, the United States Navy had determined that the USS Hoga was surplus, and through the efforts of Congressman George P. Miller, managed to work out a lease agreement between the United States Navy and the Port of Oakland uh, for a dollar a year. That's a pretty good investment, if you ask me. When the Hoga arrived, the Port of Oakland did not have a fireboat protection for their port. As part of the lease program, the Port of Oakland would be financed the, op the alterations to the Hoga at a cost of nearly $73,000 through the increased pumping capacity that was being added to her. The Hogo officially arrived at Naval Station Treasure Island May 11th, 1948, and was turned over to the Oakland Fire Department on May 18th. It seems the ceremonial transfer uh, took place on May 28th, 1948 at Grove Street Pier, where it was entered into service. In July 1948, the U.S. Togo was officially christened, christened the Port of Oakland uh, by the Port and City of Oakland themselves. In her 40-year career as the Oakland Fireboat, the vessel had combated numerous fires, waterfront blazes, rescue, uh, rescuing people in the water, and served as a tour boat for President Jimmy Carter. Though the vessel was operated by the Port of Oakland, it was still owned by the United States Navy. And in 1963, it was again reclassified as YTM-146, Yard Tug Medium. <laughs> it is also in 1955 that the name was again changed from the Port of Oakland to the City of Oakland. In 1989, the USS Hoga slash City of Oakland finally received its long overdue recognitions for its actions on December 7th, 1941, as she was listed as a National Historic Landmark. You don't need to hold that anymore. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Saving your arms, you know. Ah. <laughs> uh, whatever. However, in 1992, the city of Oakland, California, was in the market for a smaller, more maneuverable fireboat to take the place of the Hoga, or the city of Oakland at that time. At that time, it was estimated that it would take $400,000 to rehabilitate the tug, which was said uh, was about what the tug cost, or was worth. Consequently, she was retired July 29th, 1993, with a press conference called at noon. The Hoga would eventually be sent to Treasure Island uh, Naval Base in the middle of San Francisco Harbor. By early 1944, 1944, 1994, there was already discussions in some circles that would allow the Hoga to go back to Pearl Harbor. As early as 1992, there was hopes that the Hoga would be docked near the USS Arizona, as it would be used as part of their museum. Uh, there was also a plan to try to piggyback the USS Hoga on the USS Missouri, but they found that to be too uh, financially infeasible. Within her city, or with her sitting at the Treasure Island Naval Base, her significance was again notified by the National Trust of Historic Preservation, where they listed the USS Hoga as one of the most endangered historic places in 1995. Even with the designation as a national, by the National Trust, the United States Navy decided to decommission the USS Hoga in 1996 and add her to the mothball reserve fleet. Many organizations fought for the ability to finance to finance turning the USS Hoga into a museum, including organizations in Pearl Harbor, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and North Little Rock. The Hoga languished in the mothball fleet for eight years. In uh, 2002, when then Mayor Patrick Hayes floated the idea of acquiring and establishing a riverfront museum for both the USS Hoga and the USS Razorback. At that time, Greg Zahner, uh, executive director, uh, was then the spokesperson for the Save the Razorback Committee. Now executive director of the Arkansas Inland Maritime Museum stated that it's either or both. 
The perfect scenario would be to have them both. There's a good possibility they crossed paths in Pearl Harbor during the war. By 2004, the USS Razorback was officially property of the city of Little Rock, which it remained in fundraising mode for the Razorback and the Hoga. Though the Razorback arrived at the port of Little, at, in the port of Little Rock in August of 2004, the fight for the Hoga remained. By early 2005, a Florida judge dismissed a lawsuit, a lawsuit challenging the decision made by the United States Navy uh, and the, sh the Navy Ships Donation Program uh, that would allow the Hoga to uh, come here to North Little Rock. In that decision, the USS Hoga Association of Hollywood, Florida, uh, was the one that was petitioning the judge to uh, take out his, his ruling. Uh, this included uh, opening a clear path for the tugboat to be transferred to the city of Little Rock. Nearly a year after receiving the USS Razorback, former Mayor Patrick Hayes took title of the USS Hoga uh, on the 28th, 2005. Now, I don't know about you, but having a title for that thing, I don't know how big that would be. <laughs> I know getting a title for a car is hard enough. Getting a title for a sub is totally different. <laughs> this would be the beginning of a long trip to bring the Hoga from California to North Little Rock. At the time, it was estimated it would take $300,000 or $400,000, depending on who you ask, to tow the Hoga from Oakland to North, to North Little Rock via the Panama Canal again. These estimates were low, with a later estimate in, in late 2005 putting it more in the range of $900,000. However, by February 2006, the U.S. Navy still had not given clearance for the tug to be towed to North Little Rock. By October 2006, a Gulf Transport Company offered to tow the Hoga to New Orleans on a return trip from the West Coast at a cost of only $395,000, with the hopes that it would arrive by January of 2007. As usual, nothing ever went as planned, especially Mother Nature. Due to storms on the West Coast, the barge that was leaving Seattle and set, set off a chain of events that would delay the pickup of the Hoga. New plans were going to be laid in, under, in re re rearranging of cranes, barges, and tugs to help loading the Hoga uh, un onto our barge. By 2008, the, the tug was still in California, and there was only two cranes big enough to lift the Hoga into a cradle in which it would be towed, and neither crane nor crane owner was convinced to take on the job. With the continual delay, the cost of transportation to the USS Hoga was steadily rising again, to the tune of $800,000. Mayor Hayes was quoted as saying, it's easier to get a submarine from Turkey than a tugboat from California. <laughs> For four more years, negotiations between crane companies and the United States Navy, the Hoga was towed to the Defense Alliance Recycling Yard on Mare Island, where the Hoga's hull would be retrofitted and made seaworthy. This was being done to allow the city of North Little Rock to take physical custody of the vessel in hopes that the Navy would allow the Hoga to be, quote, wet towed uh, drastically reducing the time to get from California to Arkansas. The new wet tow plan took an additional three years to gain approval from the Pentagon. Nothing in government moves fast. The Pentagon did eventually approve the wet tow once all repairs were completed. The new tow plan would allow for the wet tow from Mare Island to San Diego, where it would then be dry towed to New Orleans. The Hoka was able to complete the first leg of the journey on September 15, 2015 when it arrived in San Diego. There were more heavy lifting cranes that could help in maneuvering the Hoga into its cradle, uh, located in San Diego. By October 2015, the Hoga was underway again, or so we thought. On October 10th, the Hoga left San Diego, being told by, towed by a U.S. flag tugboat, and arrived in, in, in Sendo, in Sendia, Mexico, where there they were picked up by the, the Thorco Isidore, which was owned by the Thorco Shipping Company, sailing under the flag of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Now, the flag part is going to come into effect. Yeah. This caused problems. <laughs> this caused problems as the Thorco Isidore uh, was turned away as it tried to offload the Hoga in New Orleans due to maritime law. The law in question is also known as the Jones Act. The act states that merchandise transported between ports uh, located within the United States must be carried by a vessel of the U.S.'s flag, prohibiting a foreign ship to, do, to be involved in coast-to-coast -coast trade between two U.S. ports. With the Thorco Isidore turned away, it went to Houston, where they had an office and they unloaded the tug. While negotiations between the U.S. Border Patrol and Customs, the U.S. Customs and Homeland Security, and the city of North Little Rock tried to make arrangements for continuing the Hoga's journey northward. 
By late November, the Hogo uh, was once again moving to New Orleans via tow and up the Mississippi River, and it was expected to arrive in Rosedale, Mississippi, November 22nd. Thanks to the Pine Bluff sand and gravel, uh, the USS, or the, the Rosedale, Mississippi, a barge uh, owned by Jantran, a subsidiary of Bruce Oakley, uh, Inc., towed the barge up the no to North Little Rock. These companies towed the Hoga up the Mississippi River and the Arkansas River as a donation to the city of North Little Rock and the Arkansas Inland Maritime Museum. Thanks to the donation of time and materials by these company, companies, the Hoga finally arrived uh, Monday, November 23rd, 2015. Since the outset of trying to get the Hoga, the plan was always to have the Hoga with the Razorback by December 7th. Anything you read says, we want the Hoga with the Razorback by December 7th. They never said the year. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, however, in the articles covering the Hoga, it's never stated which December 7th it was going to be. It was finally made uh, before December 7th, 2015, only 13 years after the initial idea was conceived. The, the Hogo was finally on the riverbank in North Little Rock. It was not its final location. As more wheeling and dealing was needed to be done to move her again. The museum had a large tow rope, which would be used for the Hogo, was not needed. At the time the Hogo arrived, the old Broadway bridge was being raised, for our new one, and rebuilt using large cranes. The museum had inquired about possibly using one of the cranes to help hoist the Hoga up and out of the water over the barge, and actually probably over that bridge right there, uh, and into her current location. Now, the company was not disagreeable at the time, uh, it just the timing wasn't right for them uh, with, the, with the bridge. Only a short time later, the museum received a call from the bridge company saying the crane was free, and asked the museum when they wanted to move the Hoga, to which they replied, ASAP. The crane was moved into position and the Hoga was hoisted up and moved into its current place at the cost of a heavy rope, which traveled or which was traded for their services. The Hogan has been a great new tourist attraction since it opened to the public just recently. People from all over have come to see and explore both the you know, Hoga and the Razorback so they can feel the history really come alive. However, nothing will be able to depict the feelings and the experiences of Pearl Harbor in, in December 7, 1941, or the signing of the surrender in Tokyo Bay on December 2, 1945. Today, feel free to explore the USS Hogan and ask questions of our great volunteers. Again, thank you guys for coming and have a great weekend.